on Panorama tonight. Uber, Uber, you can't hide. We expose the dark tricks Uber used to take over our cities. It was scandalous what went on, and I still can't believe that it happened in this country. A whistleblower reveals how Uber did as they pleased and got politicians to back them. It was extraordinarily easy to get access to the highest echelons of power uh, and decision making. How a series of undisclosed meetings with ministers helped Uber barge into Britain. It undermines the fabric of our society and the health of our democracy. And we uncover documents showing how rules and laws were ignored. It's a smoking gun. Not many companies get to change the language. Taking an Uber has become part of life. Paddy has been driving for the company in London for eight years. It felt very great. It was like people moving from old world to the new world. It was as simple as that. Something completely different, that like you could drive in Baker Street and get a ping, and you, someone needs to be picked up. We loved it. It was revolution. to make movement more efficient, more affordable, more accessible, more sustainable. Uber is what happened when the internet met minicabs. Order on your phone and the car finds you. You pay even tip through an app. And it's been a big hit. We are Uber. We reimagine the way the world moves for the better. In just over a decade, Uber has gone from a Californian startup to a global transport business. It takes billions of pounds a year in fares and has millions of drivers all over the world. But that is not the full story. Uber has a secret history. Mark McGann at the end there, head of public policy for the MIA region at Uber. Uh, before that, he worked. This in man lobbying. used to be one of Uber's top executives. What is Uber? You know what it is. It's a tech company, it's an app. He helped the company use the powerful to get what it wanted. Now he's turned whistleblower. It was. I think unprecedented in, in, in my career to have such easy access to senior members of government, heads of government, heads of state. It was intoxicating. Were you involved in some of the wrongdoing you're now seeking to expose? I was involved, yes, I was. I'm doing this for what I believe to be altruistic reasons. Whistleblower has leaked thousands of documents to the Guardian newspaper. It shared them with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and media groups around the world, including the BBC. This leak is about secrecy. It's about the way the corporations operate in cahoots with politicians and bureaucrats. This huge company with massive resources was able to essentially uh, challenge good governance in multiple countries at the same time. The leaked documents include emails, texts, and strategy plans. They show how much Uber spent to influence politicians. In 2016, its PR and lobbying budget was $90 million. $90 million is an enormous amount of money. The bottom line is that companies spend that amount of money because they want to influence decision making. It gives them access. 
So, what did they get for their money? I'm going to follow the revelations from the files and take an Uber trip around Europe's capitals. First stop, Amsterdam. This is Jack, and he loves being an Uber driver. I am a bit of a rebel, and that's what I like, because I'm the same myself. Oh, you like that about them? Yeah. You know, sometimes they're breaking the law, and who doesn't? Fighting the law is part of the Uber spirit. In the Netherlands, it was using illegal, unlicensed drivers, and it faced raids in 2014. But the company had a plan. One of the most shocking things in the documents is how far Uber was prepared to go to protect itself. It had a secret system for stopping the authorities getting their hands on evidence, the kill switch. It's a way for Uber's headquarters to remotely shut down access to computers and company data. The documents reveal Uber used the kill switch three times on the same days the Amsterdam offices were raided. And on one occasion, Uber's top man, then Chief Executive Travis Kalanick, gave the order. Please hit the kill switch ASAP. Access must be shut down in Amsterdam. If a CEO of Uber orders that kill switch, then theoretically he could face punishment. Yes, if well, anyone in a company, um, the CEO included, anyone in a company who gives an order um, or co-perpetrates uh, the offense of drugs and justice in the Netherlands, um, would be liable under Dutch criminal law. Uber says it now routinely cooperates with information requests and doesn't have a kill switch. Mr. Kalanick's spokesperson says he didn't obstruct justice and any accusation he did is completely false. He said Uber used a common business practice to protect intellectual property and customer privacy. These fail-safe protocols do not delete any data and were approved by Uber's lawyers. When Uber was in serious trouble here, it used one of its tried and tested tactics. It turned to one of its influential friends. Neely Kroos was the EU commissioner for digital companies like Uber until 2014. After she left the job, the EU told her she couldn't work for Uber for 18 months. But the documents show she was secretly helping the company anyway. Like when its offices were raided. The whistleblower emails the Uber chief executive and says Neely Crows is calling the Minister of Economy now and other members of the government to force the regulator and police to back off. Other internal emails remind Uber staff the relationship with Neely Kroos was highly confidential and should not be discussed. Neely Kroos says the EU granted her approval to work as a special envoy for startups and that she did not have any formal nor informal role at Uber. But the documents show she was secretly helping the company. Uber say they're working with Nelly Cruz to get a back channel going. What do you think of that? It's a smoking gun. We have evidence that during the cool-off period, a former commissioner is actually lobbying for a company 
So we are a, a clear breach. Uber eventually stopped using unlicensed drivers, but it was in the Netherlands to stay, and there are now thousands of Ubers. The second capital on our Uber tour is Paris. Adil has been driving his Uber here for a year. Do you make a good living as an Uber driver? Quand on a du courage et qu'on n'hésite pas à faire des heures, c'est comme tout métier, il faut donner de soi pour réussir. Back in 2014, Uber was creating chaos, challenging the law by using unlicensed drivers. And Uber used investors' cash to make fares cheaper, taking work from Paris's minicabs. It was an all-out taxi war. The French government passed a law making Uber's unlicensed driver service illegal, but Uber just carried on. Socialist MP Thomas Tevenu, who was later convicted of tax fraud, had been brought in to sort the problem out. How would you, in one word, describe the way Uber goes about its business? Uh, cowboy. They put one foot in the door, then break the door wide open, and once they're in, you're forced to deal with them, for better or for worse. The documents show what Uber was up to. Like in the Netherlands, they had a friend in power. And they chose well. Back in 2014, Emmanuel Macron was a rising star. The future president was Minister for Economic and Digital Affairs. The documents reveal that Uber executives attended a series of private meetings with Macron. It looks like Uber had got Mr. Macron on site. So even though its unlicensed driver service was being banned, Uber now had a powerful friend at the heart of government. The leaked documents show Uber sent dozens of texts and emails to Macron. They offered to rewrite the laws. Uber will provide an outline for a regulatory framework for ride-sharing. They thanked Mr Macron for his cooperation. Uber has a huge appreciation for you. The openness and welcome we receive is unusual in government-industry relations. And privately boasted one meeting was spectacular. We will dance soon. Uber was at the time the hottest ticket in town and people were almost falling over themselves uh, in order to meet with Uber uh, and to hear what we had to offer. The protests were now violent and the police were ordered to seize Uber drivers' cars. Uber's offices here in Paris were raided by the police. Two of its executives were arrested for illicit activity. Once again, Uber turned to its friend in government for help. The documents suggest a deal was done. Emmanuel Macron texts Uber's chief executive, Travis Kalanick. 
Macron says he will gather everybody to prepare the reform and correct the law. That's a minister secretly assuring Uber the law will be changed. President Macron's spokesperson says his job led him to interact with many companies involved in the transformation of services, which had to be facilitated by removing administrative and regulatory barriers. The files also give an insight into how ruthless Uber was prepared to be. The then chief executive, Travis Kalanick, ignored a warning about Uber drivers being attacked at a demonstration. He sent this message to colleagues. If we have 50,000 riders, they won't and can't do anything. I think it's worth it. Violence guarantees success. He viewed violence as something that brought results. It's dangerous. It's irresponsible. It's also, in a way, very selfish, because he was not the guy on the street who was being threatened, who was being attacked, who was beaten, being beaten up. Mr. Kalanick says he never suggested Uber should take advantage of violence at the expense of driver safety. The company says no one at Uber has ever been happy about violence, and its new management has made safety one of the company's top priorities. It says a new law was in no way beneficial to Uber, and that France actually adopted stricter regulations for companies like Uber. Uber didn't get its way entirely. It stopped its illegal, unlicensed driver service. But its ministerial friend became president in 2017. And under President Macron, it now has thousands more drivers than ever before. Ils ont réussi à changer. They managed to effect change through money, through marketing money, through communication money, through lobbying money. The point is that today, the French government is probably the most pro-Uber government in the Western world. The final leg of the Uber tour is back in the UK. Uber has cut the amount of money drivers get for each trip. Hadi is now a union leader, fighting Uber for better conditions. I think they see me as a robot. They don't see me as a human being. It makes you very angry. The car is not a driverless car. There's a human being, think of it, that's actually driving, that's actually being exploited. Uber has been controversial here as well. Again, it originally offered cheap affairs by subsidizing them which hit traditional London cabbies. And they too took to the streets in protest. The fares were so unrealistically low, we just couldn't do it for the, for the money that they were charging. They were a minicab firm with a flash app that pumped a load of money in to try and kill off other businesses and to capture the market. It seemed like the then mayor of London was siding with black cab drivers in their fight with Uber. 
I didn't like the attitude of the company. I thought they were being excessively sort of bumptious in the way they were, they were moving into London and claiming they could take all this business away from black cabs. This document reveals exactly how Uber worked. It says, The mayor remains the central figure in London government. He's the ultimate target of the engagement. Given these relationships, the need, therefore, is for a more positive image of Uber to be conveyed to Boris by people that he trusts and respects. To do that, the documents show Uber went into overdrive. Their lobbyists went to 10 Downing Street and met senior advisers. They reported getting useful intelligence on the mayor and his team. Our documents say that Uber's lobbyists also spoke to two government ministers that day, Matt Hancock and Sajid Javid. But the lobbying in Downing Street was never declared, so Uber's access to the heart of government remained secret. After number 10, Uber set its sights on the man next door. George Osborne, who was chancellor, was invited to a private dinner where he met Uber's then chief executive. Travis Kalanick's advisers told him the dinner would be better than a meeting in London because it would be a much more private affair with no hanger-on officials or staffers. What should our viewers make of the fact that he chose not to declare that meeting? Well, I think they should be very uh, disturbed, frankly. You or I don't get to have dinner with George Osborne, but if you are one of the up-and-coming billionaire Silicon Tech Valley people you do perfectly encapsulates the problem with lobbying and how vested interests capture ministers and decision making. The lobbying went on and on. They targeted Tory, Lib Dem and Labour MPs. The documents show Uber also met ministers including Michael Gove and Priti Patel. George Osborne and Matt Hancock had second meetings. None of them were declared. Meetings between ministers and companies where business is discussed should be declared. But the guidelines are so vague, it is hard to be sure if politicians are breaking the rules. After Priti Patel's undeclared meeting, the then Minister for Work and Pensions told Uber, I found our conversation fascinating. There is no doubt that we could forge an important partnership between Uber and my department. The danger is that if people start to think politicians are making cosy deals behind closed doors, they lose trust in democracy. It undermines the fabric of our society and the health of our democracy. Priti Patel's spokesperson says, for official meetings such as this, civil servants are present and responsible for making the appropriate recordings. For Mr Gove, a spokesperson says, no official meeting took place with Uber and so issues of the ministerial code do not arise. Matt Hancock's spokesperson says it was the policy of government to attract tech companies to the UK, and all his efforts were above board and declared properly. A spokesperson for Sajid Javid says the relevant departments hold no record of the meeting said to have taken place. George Osborne's spokesperson says that far from being secret, it was the publicly announced policy to meet tech businesses and persuade them to invest in Britain. He says 
all business meetings were properly declared. The leaked documents show Uber felt it got what it wanted from the undeclared meetings. Uber described George Osborne as a strong advocate who would take up our cause when needed. And it boasts that then Prime Minister David Cameron's senior staff are very with us. It looks like all that lobbying worked. Boris Johnson seems to have changed his mind. Proposals that would have limited Uber's expansion in London were dropped. It was scandalous what went on, and I, I still can't believe that it happened in this country. More to the point, nothing's ever been done about it. We just accept that's what's happened. OK, you had a chancellor and the prime minister lobbied for one of their mates. Oh, fine, that's all right, move on. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dara Khosrowshahi, and I'm the CEO of Uber. Uber's now been under new management for five years and says its new chief executive has transformed the company. We are proud to be tech for good at Uber. Uber says it's moved from an era of confrontation to one of collaboration. The company denies its lobbying was secret, as it has always expressed policy positions vocally and publicly. It says it has admitted many mistakes and missteps, but that engagements with governments are now both in line with the law and also transparent. Uber will not make excuses for past behaviour and asks the public to judge us by what we've done over the last five years. But Uber's still far from perfect. Its drivers are fighting for employment rights. Uber, Uber, you can't hide! Uber, Uber, you can't hide! Like in Holland and France, they are winning in court, but immediately being challenged by Uber. Let me give you another fact. They have been operating outside of the law since they came to UK. My message to Uber is very simple. Obey the, uh, the court ruling fully. Pay the drivers what they deserve. Uber, Uber, you can't hide. And the man behind the leak says he regrets his role in building Uber. I hope that there will be a change in how Uber treat their drivers. Look, I own what I did. Uh, but if it turns out to be horribly, horribly wrong, then it's incumbent upon me to go back and say, I think we made a mistake. Uber drivers do billions of journeys a year. In just a decade, the company has changed our cities. This leak reveals how Uber used politicians to help them get what they wanted. Digging beneath the surface of a system that was meant to protect. Michael Sheen lifting the lid on the care system. Watch now on iPlayer. How hopes were raised and dashed, then raised again. The final part of AIDS, the unheard tapes here on BBC Two at Nine. Here in a moment, saving lives at sea.